Hi, welcome. This is Laura from Healing with Spirit. We are here with another episode of Triggers and Spiritual Medicine. Mm. Our mission is to help others rediscover the power that lies within and to find that treasure that is buried in the depths of our own shadows and to help others become our own superhero. We are a tendency, we are a culture where we want to find the superhero outside and we forget that we actually have that within us. So we hope by helping you connect the dots like the web, um, we can help you understand the trauma infection that impacts all areas of our life, including addiction, domestic violence, racism, homelessness, sexual abuse, chronic health issues, cancer to environmental issues, climate change, and more. By highlighting these infected areas and what they share in common, we actually aspire for new perspective of solutions, healing and resolutions that can be birthed, not only birthed, but sustained. So this is very much a collaborative program. I we bring in industry experts, survivors, or others who may have figured out how whatever their trigger was or whatever their trauma was, they figured out how to become their own superhero and breaking free from the chains that bound them in the way society said, basically was not possible because you're stuck with this, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So with each episode, um, we share experiences and solutions. And today we are so happy. I am so excited to bring in this amazing human being, Kelvin Young. He is a recovery coach, a recovery support specialist, certified sound healer and owner of Kelvin Young. Today we're going to be talking about, because he comes from a, a variety of backgrounds too, where uh, from uh, trauma to high school dropout, to addiction, to crime, to prison, to now becoming this amazing speaker who travels all over the place. He has presented all over the country in diverse settings, yoga studios, retreat centers, conferences, high schools, colleges, prison, addiction treatment centers, psychiatric hospitals, and mental health agencies. Holy cow. <laughs> he also coaches and publicly speaks on addiction recovery to people from all walks of life. And he facilitates private and group sound healing sessions at different locations throughout the United States. And he is passionate about holding the space for people to heal and is known for his warm, loving, and down-to-earth way of connecting with people. And if you can't already tell, just by the energy of this amazing human being, you hopefully will be feeling this coming right through the screen. Welcome, Kelvin. Thank you so much, Laura, for that warm introduction. And it truly is an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, with you today and, and for all the people that's, that's watching and listening as well too it's an honor to be here so i'm so excited so thank, thank you, you so much absolutely yeah. so normally um we don't go so much into the trigger part uh with these episodes but i think with your story and because it can really affect i mean i think you just heard like the web of all of these things i think you can probably check off a lot of those right mm -hmm. so yeah. what i would like you know and i read something on your uh, actually your website where it says you wrote in there numbing your trauma and emotional turmoil with drugs and alcohol yeah. can you really go into that like those trigger pieces like what are some of the triggers that you struggle with growing up whether from as a child and that led you up to the path that put you in prison yes absolutely we definitely can dive deep into that and honestly it wasn't until therapy which i was able to understand uh, the root causes of my experiences uh, with addiction and why I was numbing uh, the emotional distress and pain that I experienced for a very, a very long time. And I learned that it stems back to childhood for me. And, you know, for many years I felt, I didn't feel good enough. You know, I felt um, a sense of, of shame and guilt. Um, I ended up um, being kept back in kindergarten and that mm -hmm. had a, a very profound um, negative effect on, on my psyche, on my emotional uh, being, because I didn't feel good enough. I didn't feel smart enough. I felt less than. Um, I dealt with a lot of intense uh, sadness growing up. Um, a lot of- Now, was that, st was that stuff that like was reinforced to you or just something that organically you felt with inside? Like, did somebody reinforce type of thing? Was that- something that somebody said you weren't worthy enough or all those things like where did that kind of come from 
Well, as a, as you know, growing up as a black person in America, a lot of that stems from the structural oppression, the structural racism mm -hmm. uh, that this country was built upon. You know, so mm -hmm. we was considered subhuman, uh, subhuman. You know, we were treated in subhuman conditions, three fifths of a human being. So a lot of those ideologies was passed down, you know, from generation to generation. And a lot of that has been internalized and not even realizing it because it was subconscious. You know, mm -hmm. it was a subconscious um, uh, stigma uh, that we had on ourselves based on uh, the messages that we receive uh, from this American culture that we lived in. So feeling like a second class citizen that had a lot to, to play with it, but it, it was um, subconscious for me. And mm -hmm. like just not feeling good enough, you know, I, I can't describe like where it came from, but I can yeah, no, but that actually it. says a lot right there, right? Absolutely. Because yeah, you 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 believe like you were you couldn't hold up to what society says because of the color of your skin, right? And I think, you know, especially somebody like myself who's white, you know, we don't really understand unless we walk in your shoes. So I appreciate you sharing this because it helps us understand mm -hmm. some of the things that you know, especially, you know, we hear all the time, right? What black men go through, especially with the police, the police profiling that we, mm -hmm. we see going on. So, yeah. um, and that's, that's a real thing. You know, I hear that from a lot of folks of color in, in my area that mm -hmm. have expressed similar concerns, you know, and their mm -hmm. own personal experiences. Absolutely. And then how did that lead to like, this the actual numbing of some of these things? And did you ex actually experience like childhood trauma on top of that? Well, th that was tra traumatic right, because, right, you right. know, I learned from Gabriel Monte is trauma is not what necessarily happened to you. Trauma is what happens inside of you, the way you mm. see yourself, the world and the people in it. So just the whole experience of the American culture and how I internalized that, that racial stigma within myself, that was very traumatizing in itself. And never mind just the other experiences I go through, being kept back from school. That was uh, a traumatic experience for me. Um, mm. just like the culture that I grew up in, in my household, I grew up with four older brothers. It was a very violent household. You know, okay. we, we, it was tough love, you know, it, disguised as discipline. And it was a very, um, intense way of growing up and dealing with a lot of, uh, self-worth issues, a lot of self-esteem issues that this mm. for me it exacerbated the, the, the feelings of of low self-esteem and, and and not good enough. So therefore growing up, you know, and in, our, in this culture that we live in, having older brothers that I've seen drink and, and use drugs, I kind of follow within that pathway. And I remember, you know, taking my first sip of alcohol and how that made me feel. And mm. by drinking alcohol, socializing, having a good time, you know, on the surface, but in inside it was really taking away the pain that i felt at a very young age you know and i was feeling what was good. the first time you, you took out what was the first time you took your first drink how old were uh, you i was 13 years old 13. Uh, when i first okay. uh, started drinking alcohol and it and it progressed you know first of all it started off as a weekend thing where i was drinking um on the weekends with my older brothers and cousins and i wasn't just drinking just beer you know at that time it was drinking malt liquor which is mm. um a beverage that's highly highly pushed within the black community you know it's not regular beer it's malt liquor um so it, it mm. has um you know it has a, a alcohol consumption is higher than than regular beer and you know i enjoy that taste i enjoy uh drinking that and I noticed how it progressed in my life. You know, it started off on the weekends, then three or four times uh, during a week. Then it started being more on a consistent basis. And as I grew up, you know, I started, you know, find myself going to school, intoxicated, um, skipping school, skipping classes, uh, going to school dances, you know, intoxicated. I remember my brother used to go pick up some blackberry brandy for us and me and my friends used to go in the, in the bathrooms uh, at school and just drink it down, you know, and how mm. that would make us feel. I w I'm also a natural introvert. So when I when I drink alcohol, mm -hmm. I was able to express myself what I thought I was able to express myself more freely. I was more extroverted uh, when I was under the influence of alcohol during that time. So therefore the alcohol was doing something for me, not only numbing that pain, you know. That no, I know as, a recover as a recovery coach, is that? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, as a record coach, you see that introversion piece very common with folks with addiction, like as like, uh, you know, 
trying to bring out that extroversion piece too? Yeah, you know, there's a reason why people consume alcohol or or any other drug, you know. And oftentimes, I learned from my experience, you know, it's it's underneath the addiction is the unhealed emotional pain, uh, the mm -hmm. unprocessed trauma, or the toxic chronic stress, you know. And most most times, people reach for something outside of themselves to to, to deal with that distress that mm -hmm. they're feeling with inside themselves, whether it's being introverted and want to be more extroverted, uh, whether it's uh, a childhood trauma, adult uh, trauma, or just adolescent trauma that they experience in their life. Uh, that's the stress and not having coping skills to, to deal with the distress. And we live in a culture that we, you know, we, we seek pleasure and avoid pain. And we want that instant gratification. We do. <laughs> we yeah. so do, don't we? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So how, did, so how did you go from like, you know, yeah, everything. I mean, how many how many kids go and they party? Nothing happens, right? You know, mm. and how did it go from that element to then escalating it into, as you wrote, like you engaged in, you quit high school at seventeen, mm -hmm. you engaged in criminal activity mm -hmm. that ultimately, I'm I'm assuming based on what I read, that landed you in jail. Mm -hmm. So what what how did how did it go from one to the next to the next? Well, it started off socially, it started off fun, but not dealing with the un, unchecked uh, emotional distress that I experienced, you know, I started drinking for a, another reason. You know, I wasn't drinking to be social. I was drinking to get drunk. I was drinking to escape the emotional pain. And that's a, a different level of, of drinking. Mm -hmm. And people get caught up in that, in that very vicious cycle when we have unchecked um, trauma or process emotional pain and not dealing with it through therapy or through like traditional healers or any other modality to help us to, to deal with the distress. I didn't have no idea about therapy. And one thing, um, there's a big stigma around therapy within the black communities as well too. We don't, we don't um, air our, our, our business out to no one outside the family um, because there's a lot of uh, mistrust within the medical establishment, rightly so. You know, when we think about the different um, um, experiment and, and, and um, traumas that happen uh, to black folks uh, in the medical establishment and every establishment in America, but particularly in the, in the medical establishment. And that's why we see uh, the, uh, the, the, tr the stigma for getting mental health, female, even addiction treatment as well too, because of, of those experiences that black folks experience, um, you know, early, uh, you know, in, in the past and historical um, experiences that we went through. So therefore, you know, we was, I wasn't really taught to, you know, go to therapy or to deal with the distress. So therefore going for that instant gratification, which is alcohol, which is very deceptive, even though I was, I was under the age, but alcohol is legal. So therefore it, it's very deceptive because people think it's just like a social thing, but it's one of the worst drugs out there. Mm -hmm. You know, many people die yearly basis of alcohol related deaths. And, and we, we, my father used to say as a physician that and smoking are legally acceptable suicide yeah in our in our in our society like absolutely <laughs> yeah yeah and, and our in our culture it, it really is and you know i kind of numbed myself where i wasn't wasn't drinking socially no more you know i was, I was mm. drinking to to really numb that pain and it worked for a while for me until it didn't work and i got caught up in that very vicious cycle of addiction but i wasn't able to see that very vicious cycle that i was in but the people that that was around me, the people that truly cared about me, um, that was outside of of my my circle, because my inner circle, this is what we did. So therefore, it, it seemed normal for us to, um, you know, excessively drink and blackout and all the things that we did. You know, driving on an influence and getting arrested and and you know going to court and just laughing about it the next day and, and doing it all over again. You know, it was a subculture that. I got caught up in, you know, on top of the, the fast lifestyle of hustling drugs, using drugs, um, the fast lifestyle with women. Um, it just, it was a whole lifestyle, the whole culture that I was a part of. And I didn't see the problem because I had so many other distractions um, that was kind of taking my, my vision off uh, the root problem that I was, that I was dealing with mm. inside. So, Tell us the time, you know, that, that, that landed you, like, what was the, the incident that kind of put you in jail? Like, what was that incident that, cause obviously this, you being incarcerated, mm -hmm. 
you know, was a pivotal, pivotal moment for you in your life. Yeah. So yeah. what was that incident that put you there that changed mm -hmm. your life at the same time? Absolutely. You know, I've been to jail a few times and I'll get mm -hmm. out to do the same thing over again, which I revolve in door. I remember the first time I went to prison in, in the 90s, you know, the, the counselor said that 95 percent of y'all will be back, you know, and I was like, what kind of stuff is that? You know, that's not encouraging. That's not supportive. Mm -hmm. But for my situation, you know, he was correct, you know, and they call it the revolving door for a reason. So I was, you know, I'll go to prison you know, do uh, do my time and get out to do the same thing over again, using drugs, uh, selling drugs and that fast lifestyle. Uh, but my last uh, prison uh, bid that I did, I never forget the day on March 5th, um, 2009. You know, it, it was it was uh, a very transformative day, but it was, it was a very violent one for me as well, too. I remember going to my girlfriend house. She lived in Stafford Springs, my girlfriend at the time. And I was traveling, you know, it was a, a long day. I had court in, 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 a, in a court in New Britain. I had a couple of cases going on, violation of probation. Um, so I was, I was looking at jail time and dealing with the distress of court, you know, at the court. I ended up getting, getting drunk, drinking brandy, drinking E&J, doing coke, um, doing heroin. Uh, smoking marijuana, you know, just alcohol, just uh, a consumption of, of alcohol and other drugs. And living in Middletown and driving all the way to Stafford Springs, I remember I had, a, I had to actually cover one eye so I was able to see, because I was seeing doubles. That's how intoxicated I was. I should have mm. never been on the road. And I'm driving to my, my girlfriend's house at the time, and I made it there. And once she opened the door, she looked at me in total uh, disgust. And it was like you know, you're drunk again, you know, you're, it, it was just, I was a, a complete mess. And, you know, we got in an argument, she ended up leaving. Then, you know, she came, uh, came back. Then I, that's when I took some of her, her Klaudipins because she had Klaudipins, um at the time. And just that combination of Klaudipins and alcohol and, and cocaine and heroin, it, it was just a, a toxic, uh, a very toxic, um, wow. cocktail of, of, of drugs and substances. And I, I'm so grateful to be telling this story here today. And yeah, just, you're, you're lucky. And thank you. You know, yeah. that somebody was watching over your shoulder, Kelvin, I mean, Absolutely. for a bigger purpose, you know? Absolutely. And, you know, when she came home, we got into this very, very, um, um, very serious uh, physical altercation, you know, where I, I picked her up and I slammed her against the glass um, table at, we had and it just shattered in so many different places and you know when I when I thought about that you know it, it was very hazy because I was on an influence but when I think about it you know I'm so grateful that I, you know I'm not in jail for a very long time because I could have really um, you know it could have punctured one of her lungs or, or organ and I could have been in prison for a very long time and it was very serious altercation you know and I remember hearing the, the, the knock on the door and, you, you know, people that's been arrested, they know that knock, you know, the knock of the police. And it got to the point where I was just tired. I was done. I know I was looking at prison time. I just didn't know how much. And with this altercation right here, um, the court cases that I was, I was facing uh, in New Britain and Rockville and here in Connecticut, I know I was doing time, but I was just was done. I was exhausted. You know, I was just completely Mm. you know, ready to surrender at that time. And, you know, the, the police came, you know, arrested me and took me to Hartford Corrections. And and I never, you know, forget calling my, my family, calling my mother and, and calling the, the mother my daughter and hearing them crying and telling me that I need help. I need um, to get my life together. And that that moved me, you know, and talking to my daughter and my daughter, Tatiana, she was – you know, she was my inspiration, you know, for me to find the inner motivation for me to change my life for the better, because I realized I wanted to be the man, the father that my daughter could look up to and be proud of. Mm. And I was in and out of prison, you know, her life, in her life, you know, and emotionally unavailable for a lot of times in her life and not really doing anything with my life. I said in and out of prison, selling drugs, using drugs. My daughter see me physically and emotionally abusive. She see me intoxicated in heroin and, and other drugs. Um, she just seen a lot of um, abuse, and I'm sure that abuse was very traumatic for her, seeing her father 
um, acting in that way. So, you know, she was that, that inspiration for me to just really just uh, change my life for the better. And while I'm in prison, I made my, I never forget laying on my bunk bed and said, this is it, you know, I need to change my life for the better. Cause the old saying we hear uh, in 12 step communities, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I made that mm-hmm. decision right there to change my life uh, for the better. And I took advantage of all the program that was available while I was in prison because I had to be there for a little while. Um, I ended up getting sentenced to 26 months, uh, a little over two years uh, in prison. Mm-hmm. And I had to be there. But this time, this was my fourth prison sentence. And this time, I was ready to do the work. I was ready to to make some changes in my life, consciously make th- some changes in my life, you know, because I wanted to be the, the man and the father that my daughter could look up to and be proud of. So she was that inspiration uh, for me to to really begin doing the, the inner work so I can really begin the healing. That's, you know, you know, I mean, you're familiar with some of the work I do. I mean, I work with victims of domestic violence. It's been part of my my background and training for 16 years. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think there's a misconception when it comes to domestic violence, you know, um, you know, and even with the court system, you know, I know coming from a victim of domestic violence, I never mm-hmm. wanted to incarcerate my ex for the abuse he perpetuated on me. Mm-hmm. I just wanted the abuse to stop. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of us just wants the abuse to stop. But at the same time, like for somebody like yourself who, who didn't needed to learn skills to learn how to make those changes, mm-hmm. There needs to be a break, right? To be able to, so you can grow and the other person, because the other, so it's like, once it's done, it's done, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, I grew up in an abusive household myself, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, I actually feel safer now to talk about now that my father's passed, because I didn't want his, how I grew up to tarnish the man that I knew who he was in the end, because he did make the changes, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I do believe some people now, are there some abuses that will never change? Absolutely. I think there's this, there's like this fine line, but I think that some people that are abusive aren't necessarily an abuser. I think there's like all these these gray areas that would be a whole conversation, right? For another, another episode. Right. But, you know, I, I commend you for one acknowledging, you know, I mean, I helped a friend of mine run a men's group one time and I Mm -hmm. thought I was floored. We did this one experiment where. The men had to admit harm that they did on a woman. And we did it in a way where it was in a way anonymous. So that way it was like no name attached and each person had to to write on a piece of paper and then somebody drew. So that way we didn't know whose story they were reading Mm -hmm. Uh, because there is judgment. Humans judge, right? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) So I was amazed and I told the men, I never thought I'd hear in a million years, mm. hear some of these men acknowledge some of the kinds of abuses they had perpetuated on women yeah. and that how that was eating away because they've been trying to change that. But you can't change what you also can't acknowledge. So mm-hmm. I do believe it can happen. Right. Mm-hmm. So how did what did you learn in present? Like, I know, like the title of your book that, by the way, we're going to put a link for those who are interested in his book. Mm-hmm finding freedom from behind bars, a journey of self-discovery and healing. Like, how did you discover first sound healing? Like, what was your first introduction? Like, how did you learn that? Yeah, I mean, you know, being in a drug treatment program within prison, you know, they had these different holistic modalities, which is was very, like, interesting to me. You know, Mm -hmm. they had different practices such as yoga, meditation, uh, creative expressive arts like poetry and journaling, you know, sound healing. And it had a lot of misconceptions about yoga, about meditation. And yeah, because like, yoga is supposed to be for like a, has a certain stigma, right? Yeah, yeah. Not good, I, not good for you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I honestly thought yoga was for rich white women, you know, because of the way it's marketed in the United States. And I thought, mm. um, you know, meditation was for Buddhists and hippies, you know, and I didn't subscribe to none of that. So. I didn't think it was for me. You know, I didn't see a lot of people that look like me. I didn't see people of color practicing meditation and yoga, particularly at that time. You know, so that was for somebody else. That's not for me. You know, but I know the things I was doing prior to going to prison, it just wasn't working for me no more. So I had to Mm. try something new and different. And I'm so glad that I stepped out my comfort zone and utilized meditation and sound healing and yoga as a vehicle to go within because I truly do believe that healing begins from within. You know, I was able to find that sense of, mm-hmm. of calmness and inner peace, 
even being in a very hostile and restrictive environment such as prison. But most importantly, I was able to understand the root causes of my experiences with addiction, you know. And like I said before, you know, the root causes for me was that unhealed emotional pain that I experienced in my life. The unprocessed trauma that I endured, yeah. and that toxic chronic stress was at the root of my addiction. You know, and for many years, I was reaching for something outside of myself to find a sense of relief from that distress. And it worked for a while, you know, until, until it didn't work anymore. And I got caught up in that very vicious cycle of addiction. You know, and it, it's when I, being in prison, I was taken out of my element, so to speak, and, and put in a place where I couldn't leave, but I had an opportunity. I really had an opportunity to do the inner mm. work, you know, so therefore, even though I was incarcerated, I was able to find freedom for my substances um, because there was a lot of, there's a lot of drugs in prison, just the same, you know, but I chose not to, to mm. consume any, any drugs while I was incarcerated because I really wanted to do the inner work in order to, in order to heal. And by by learning these different practices like meditation and allowing me to go within. But once I started meditating with sound, with ambient sounds, um, relaxing sounds, you know, it, it, you know, the sounds was an anchor to keep me in the present moment because I'm in prison, you know, so therefore there's different different noises, different, you know, just a lot of tension and everything. So therefore it was kind of distracting for me just to focus on my breath and trying to sit in mm -hmm. silence. But once I was able to incorporate sound into my meditation practice and using that as a form of sound healing, it just was a profound experience. I wasn't in prison no more. You know, I, it, 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 physically I was in prison, uh, but emotionally, spiritually, mentally, I wasn't in prison in, anymore. And I, I noticed how that the profound effect that doing these practices was 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 having on me, you know, just the, the shift, the way I see myself, the world and the people in it. It just was it was profound being in prison. I was learning how to uh, to respond to the situation instead of, you know, being on the fault mode and then knee jerk reaction, I um, mean, in reactive mode. And by using sound and allow that to be a vehicle for me to go within through the practice of meditation, I was able to see all those emotions that are suppressed, you know, under the influence of alcohol and other drugs. And all those emotions while I was in prison was able to come up to the surface. And I learned tools that could help me to process those emotions in, in healthier ways instead of you know reaching for something outside of myself such as the alcohol mm -hmm. or the other drugs to deal with the distress and one of the tools i learned was was poetry expressive arts mm -hmm. when i was able to kind of process my emotions in a healthy way and really express myself in a healthy way and, and to really reflect you know um on my inner landscape through the practice of meditation and sound healing i was able to visualize what's going on inside of me and to really be able to process it through the form of poetry and if it's okay, Laura, I'd like to share a sure. poem that I wrote while I was in um, the drug treatment program. Which Absolutely. It was very therapeutic for me then, and yeah. it's therapeutic for me now. And Absolutely. The name, the name of this poem is called Eyes of a Silent Sun. Look into my eyes and tell me what you see. Is it a lost soul with no control, trying to be free? As I look into the mirror and stare into my eyes, I see all the anger and self-hate hypocrisy and lies. I see resentment, frustration, embarrassment and pain. I see jail bars and fancy cars as I cruise down memory lane. I see the feelings I repressed going back to childhood. I need to let go of those feelings. I would if I could. I see the hurt that I caused to the ones I love the most. I see my brother on his wedding day as we celebrate with a toast. I see the good and bad times that I experienced in my life, but it's so hard to let go of all that bitterness and strife. There's a sense of sadness when you look into my eyes, like the ones you see when a close relative dies. But this death is not physical, it has to do with the soul. It's that morbid feeling we get when our spiritual energy is low. It's like nothing matters anymore, like that day when I was fired, feeling depressed and weak can't sleep but I'm so tired I'm tired of all the pain the hurt and the rain from that cloud that keeps following me sometimes I think I'm insane but when I look out the window and see the beauty of the lake it reminds me of good times like when I was nine and things were fine and with the sunrise I can feel the presence of the creator when I look out my window I see me in the beauty of nature I'm a part of God's creation nature in humanity the loving spirit that's in jesus is also in me 
So I learned to love myself and others just for who we are. And I learned all about this love looking out my window with jail bars. And for me, mm -hmm. I, I learned about love in a very unusual place, you know, in prison behind bars and practicing meditation and sound healing, allowing that to be that vehicle to go within. I was able to see the shame and guilt that often keep people like myself in that very vicious cycle of addiction. But I was able to move past that shame and guilt and connect to the true essence of who I am. Yeah. And I believe the true essence that you and all the, your, your audience is, is that unconditional agape love. And, and for me, love is more than just, you know, a human emotion. I believe that love is a vibration. It's a frequency and it's our natural state of being. So once I was able to understand that the same love and divine essence that created the sun, the moon, the stars, mm -hmm. all the beauty of nature, it created me, it created each and every one of you. And that helped me to shift my mentality, the, the way I see myself, the world and the people in it, my worldview from a victim mentality. Oh, I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic, I'm a convicted felon, yeah. I'm a high school dropout, to more of an empowered mentality. And understand, if I want to get metaphysical, you know, understand I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. And I just truly do believe that life is about learning, growing, and evolving. And I had, yeah. a, had an opportunity to learn so much uh, while I was incarcerated. And that's why today I, I call it divine intervention, because I was able to really begin doing the, the, the inner work I needed to do in order to find freedom from alcohol and other drugs. It helped me to shift the way um, I seen life. And I believe healing is all about shifting our worldview, our perspective, right. and, and, and looking at life in a different, a different light. Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, for those who may not necessarily quite understand what Calvin is saying, like, oh, meditation, like, they may still be in that meditation, like, mm -hmm. sound healing, like, okay, like, that must be some like, Here's the thing. Here, here's the science behind it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some forms of meditation for those who have, do have a history of trauma can actually be very triggering for some if it's mm -hmm. not the right uh, form of meditation. Because if you've got histories of PTSD or complex PTSD, mm -hmm. when you what happens is when you go into that what's called a relaxation response, it can trigger things that you're not understanding in that. Mm -hmm. But when you add sound healing through, like, I love my Tibetan bowls. I got like 10 of them. So mm -hmm. um, with especially traditional Tibetan singing bowls, what I find is, that especially with trauma, it bypasses that blood brain barrier. And instantly, it's almost like a natural sed uh, sedation where mm -hmm. it just brings everything into alignment. And we forget that we are made up of mostly water. So when we mm -hmm. encompass sound healing like that, what is it doing? It's doing this to our human body from a very, from a very liquid state, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just want to bring that in for, for folks that say, well, I don't know, like, whatever. I mean, I just ran it for the first time in an addiction group yesterday, right? And, mm -hmm. and it, they got exposed and they were like, and they were all in for it. But, you know, unless you're exposed and you try it and you see, um you don't know and then what happens is when you do that meditation in the tibetan bowls you everything gets aligned so you get the clarity so then you're able to process you know i always say my, my whole thing when i teach people about processing it's stop pause you got to create the space so like do you do you reflect do you heal what like what's what's the what what is it that needs to happen so you know what action you need to take to process right yeah yeah and like the, there's there's things that happen with the vibrational again we forget that we respond and i've tried other like things that are, are used in traditional healthcare, mm -hmm. you know and i find there is something that happens with like the tibetan singing bowls for instance like mm -hmm. i looked at neurofeedback and other things that considered like to be comparable right and mm -hmm. And I go, yeah, but I've gotten like these results. Like I had somebody once that just pretty much came from the emergency room that should have been hospitalized. And yeah. we got them 85% symptom improved in less than like less than 36 hours, mm -hmm. no drugs. Yeah. <laughs> like, because the, what you're talking about is affecting the physiology. Like I want to go and tell people like, if you haven't, like this isn't just like woo woo. You, some of you might be like, well, this is like woo woo, right? I'm giving you like the physiology, like your heartbeat, your ability for your heart to pump. 
actually self-generates electricity, right? And so when you add that with the frequency, the sound, the vibration, mm -hmm. it's stimulating all of that from a very scientific physiological standpoint. Like, you yeah. know, it's not just, oh, I'm going to be like, ah, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And a lot of you times know? my silent experience is, is not blissful. You know, it, it is triggering. It is activating a lot of those unprocessed. But I believe you've got to feel before we heal. And, uh, and, and, and Nikki Myers, she's the founder of Yoga and 12 Step Recovery, beautiful black woman. She often says that our issues live in our tissues. And I find that to be very, very true. The trauma that we experience in our life, those emotions that we suppress or repress, it's in our bodies, it's in our muscles, it's in our tissues. Our cells have memory and our body keeps score of all of our experiences that we go through in our lives. And the beautiful thing about the sounds, the vibrations, the tones and frequencies from the different healing tools that I utilize during my sound healing sessions, it penetrates to the cellular level and helps to release some of that stuck energy or stagnant emotions or trauma that's in our bodies. And oftentimes it's released in the form of tears, you know, which is a beautiful thing. Some people get different mm -hmm. colors may come to their conscious awareness, you know, different thoughts may come to their conscious awareness. They might get different tingling, trembling sensations in certain parts of the body. You know, I was in the Berkshires last night and, you know, we did a, a sound healing session, a cacao ceremony. And, um, you know, the vibrations and tones that I utilize, one of the women came up to me and said that, you know, her ex-boyfriend, uh, which he passed away from, from, you know, from a drug addiction and she never was able to get the closure that she wanted. And mm. he came to her, you know, last night during a sound healing session and the cacao ceremony. And um, it was a sense of closure for her. And she got emotional. I just get emotional just touch talking about it and how, you know, she never was able to get that closure because he passed on and went to the other side because of his addiction. But him yeah. his presence, you know, feeling his presence coming to him and saying that he's sorry, you know, and just really acknowledging the, the hurt and the wrong that he caused on her and how that was. Spear works in mysterious way, ways, right? doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it's a so powerful I, experience for her. I, um, I use a lot, you know, because mm -hmm. I've been doing trauma work for like, I think, 16 years now. And mm -hmm. I correlate it to when, if we look at like a three-legged stool, right? Mm -hmm and who we are is a, is a re resemblance of a three-legged stool one leg is like the physical self the second leg is like the mental emotional and psych self and the third one is mm -hmm. the spiritual self mm -hmm. and as I, like I said yesterday in, in this one group that i ran um i said if you're only trying to heal one or two of the legs the, the stool mm -hmm. can't stand you can't mm -hmm. you will never become fully whole Mm -hmm. because trauma also can, I agree, like our, our issues that live in our tissues. I mean, I work on somatics all the time because I say mm -hmm. trauma, we do so much trauma work up here, mm -hmm. but we forget that our physical body has its own way of processing trauma Absolutely. and our healthcare system doesn't know how to, is ill-equipped to know how to deal with it. They just say, here's a pill, mm -hmm. here's this, here's that. And all that does is numb those things. It doesn't actually heal it. Yeah. And so we're broken in that, 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 that area. And I know a lot of trauma experts are really it's so refreshing the past five years mm -hmm. to see all these trauma experts really releasing a lot of these studies to show something that I know, and I know you know, that we've been doing for, for years with folks that, look, you know, when you feel this in the body, you know, like I know with breast cancer, for instance, 100% of the people I work with breast cancer all have a history of some sort of traumatic uh, history, whether it's child abuse, sex abuse, or domestic violence, yeah. that somehow didn't get healed in the body. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying, by the way, all people with breast cancer, this is the case. It just happens to be 40 something women that I've worked with, whether it's coincidence or what, but it's just one, one aspect. And, you know, the sound healing and the addiction, like the addiction, I, I look at the addiction, like we were talking about earlier, the addiction is still a symptom of something else, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's still, some, it's, it's some, it's a symptom of that, right? And it's like, how do we drill down, right? In, into that. And we are a culture that says, turn your power over to everybody else. Yeah. Turn it over. I'll, you know, your doctors will do it. Your schools will do it. Your family will do it. This, mm -hmm. The police will do it. Everybody will take care of it for you. And we don't even know. We don't even know. Like we have this here to connect the mental body with the physical body. Mm -hmm. But I can't tell you how many people don't even know how to do that. Like yeah. they don't even yeah. know how to connect here. And that's so, so important. Yeah. Your work. So how did you go from experimenting with this, you know, learning from your own self-healing in prison to then, you know, 
getting out of prison and the things that you're doing are so amazing. I really want to focus on this now, like (laughs) the speaking that you're doing, like how did you become like a recovery coach? Like what, you know, and then getting certified and doing the sound healing and, and really tying it all together as like one package. Yeah. I mean, when I was in prison, you know, in the drug treatment program in there, they had what we call peer mentors. And, you know, we was helping other people that was incarcerated with me um, to deal with, with their addiction issues. Like I said, there was a lot of drugs in prison, um, a lot of pain and distress in, in prison as well, too. Um, a lot of negative, um, it's a very negative, toxic um, and hostile environment to be in. And, you know, the counselors went home at four o'clock, you know, but we were there 24 seven. We had to deal with the negativities from the COs, you know, even dealing with the negativity with other people incarcerated with us. You know, we got negative phone calls, you know, and, and, you know, I lost romantic relationships when I was in prison. So that's a lot of emotional pain just to hold in. And being in prison, we wear these masks all the time. Whereas, you know, we got to have this, this tough guy to peel, you know, and we mm-hmm. can't show our emotion, we can't show our vulnerability because that could be, um, you know, that could, could be dangerous. Could be dangerous for us. Yeah. yeah. So therefore, you know, a, a situation can happen, a violence can happen you know, from zero to 100 really, really quick, you know, but having a peer mentor there, having people that you could talk to, help you to process what's going on in your life, help you to share it instead of reacting to it, and, you know, uh, in a violent way or an aggressive way, having somebody to, to talk to about it and to, to release it, um, have groups going on while the counselor is gone throughout the, throughout the evening. It was very healing. And that experience, you know, it, it gave me like the, the, the passion to really work with people like myself that's dealing with mental health and addiction issues, you know. So I put together th- these goals while I was in prison. It's like, okay, I'm going to go back to school, get training uh, to work in addiction recovery field. You know, I want to, to write a book. You know, I, I want to, you know, I really put down my goals of what I wanted to do. So once I was released from prison, you know, I was able to go back to school to get trained as a re- recovery coach and a recovery sports specialist. You know, then I was able to dive deep into my sound healing practice and really get trained to be a certified uh, a sound therapist or sound healer. Um, you know, I had opportunity to be a co-founder of a, a holistic healing center in Hartford, Connecticut called Toivo. Uh, which was a, a state funded, you know, we were funded by the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services here in Connecticut, where mm. we offer holistic practices for people that's in recovery, in or seeking recovery, uh, without no cost, you know, they could come for free and learn different modalities such as sound healing, meditation, yoga, because we believe that no one should be denied the benefits of yoga, meditation, sound healing, qigong, based on socioeconomic standing, psychiatric histories or experiences with addiction that these modalities is for, for everyone. And today, you know, I work in the healthcare, you know, field still, um, and I, I'm a recovery specialist and I work with people that's in or seeking recovery. And a lot of people are dying from, from opiates, you know, it, it's the highest it's ever been, you know, of, of uh, over um, opiate related deaths in one year. So therefore, you know, I'm working with um, medical professionals and to really keep people alive and uh, I had a lot of mis- misconception about medication for addiction treatment, such as Suboxone or Methadone, or the MAT program. But I realized, because that wasn't my experience, you know, when I was on heroin mm. and, and, you know, I didn't use uh, no type of medication for addiction treatment. But I realized, you know, working in this profession, and so many people are dying, particularly from fentanyl and other opiates, is that they can't really do the inner work. They can't really heal if they're, if they're dead. So yeah. this medication is going to keep a person alive, going to keep a person grounded. It's going to keep a person stable for them to address the root causes, uh, really um, deal with uh, uh, the pain that they're dealing with uh, from their addiction, which is just a symptom of the, right. of the root problem. Um, they're really just working with them. And just the power of peer support. You know, when I'm able to connect with another human being that experienced addiction issues and let them know that I've been there as well, too, I see the walls go down. And mm. when the walls go down, that's when I had the potential to connect with another human being heart to heart and really let people know that this is this relationship, this working relationship is based on mutuality. You know, how different yeah. hierarchies when, you know, a therapist and um, a patient or a client, whatever the case may be, the, the, the dynamics is different. Um, but when I, I'm a recovery specialist and as a person that's in or seeking recovery, our relationship is based on mutuality. And yeah. we, learn, we learn and grow from each other. And there's so much power, just so much healing power within peer support. And that's what yeah. I learned while, while I'm in prison. I and think you hit a couple, 
I think you hit a couple of things that are so important to reiterate. One, like what comes to mind when you're talking about the opiates, mm -hmm. we are a country that only that teaches doctors that the only way to treat a patient is a pill or a procedure. Mm -hmm. They do not learn holistic therapies or uh, nutrition or lifestyle skills because that's not profitable, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, let's just get real with that, you know, um, it, we, we goes right down. We can go to Rockefeller funded millions of dollars back in the 30s to change the way doctors were being trained in medical school back in the in the 30s, mm -hmm. you know, so that kind of led to how like the opiate epidemic and anybody who wants to really get an idea, I highly encourage you to watch the uh, watch the um, docuseries, uh, well, not, doc well, not docuseries, but the the, the series uh, Dope Sick. Mm -hmm. because that really can give you a clue to what really transpired with um, the opiate epidemic. The other um, thing, which I actually just forgot I was going to say, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, is like, I, oh, I agree with like, you know, there's this a stigma and I see it both in the domestic violence community. I see it in the addiction community. Mm -hmm. I see it in the uh, psychotherapy industry that it is stigmatized to not share anything with your client patient or whatever it is mm -hmm. about yourself and what i have found is i understand like the premise of why that is because some people just end up turning the therapy session about me i'm going to tell you my story mm -hmm. <laughs> right but i have learned like because i do get ther therapists that refer their like clients that have been like sexually assaulted or whatever mm -hmm. and when i say when I, I remember this one girl who came to me and she was all a bundle of nerves but the minute i said to her I lost my virginity to a rapist at 15. Mm -hmm. It was like, Open up. yeah, she opened up. I didn't have to go into the details, mm -hmm. right? I didn't have to go, well, you know, no, it was like, and I didn't have to try to fix her. I think that's the other thing that we also have to talk about, like people that do some like that want to do this work, mm -hmm. make sure you do your work first before you go and you yeah. do some of this work because that's one of the reasons why they don't want you going and sharing a story because you haven't some of those people haven't done that work on themselves yet mm -hmm. right because that's so so important what are some of the things you see when you like i know you shared that one story with that woman you just did last night right mm -hmm. what are some of the things you see um what are some of the reactions when you expose folks to this like whether you're speaking at a prison or you're speaking you know about whether it's about just recovery or just sharing a story saying, look, you, you don't have to be, you, you can change the ending to the story. You don't have to live that label, right? Right, right? Whatever that is, like, what are some of those responses? Like when, when people hear that for the first time, it's very powerful. And one of the things I let people know that addiction is a human experience, not a human identity, you know, mm -hmm. so behind the so-called addict behind the so-called alcoholic is a human being that experienced a significant amount of trauma, emotional distress, and toxic chronic stress, and just looking for a sense of relief from that distress. And we live in a culture and a society that conditions us to reach for something outside of ourselves when we're dealing with any type of pain, whether it's a physical pain or, or emotional pain. You know, as a kid growing up, if I ever had a toothache or a headache, I was conditioned to reach for aspirin, Tylenol, and what have you. And I use a physical painkiller such as Oxycontin, Vicodins, and Percocets, and heroin to deal with an emotional pain. And it worked for a while, like I said, in, until it didn't work anymore. And I got caught up in a very vicious cycle of addiction. And when I reframe that, the human experience like that, you know, people can really understand that and grasp, you know, and move past the stigma, move past the, um, you know, the discrimination associated with people with addiction. And that's why language matters. I never mm -hmm. use the word addict. I know I don't use the word alcoholic. I don't identify with those words. If anything, I'll say the addicted person use person centered words, you know, or a person that's dealing with um, addiction issues or or if I want to get clinical substance use disorder, you know, but the person is always first and it, it is a human experience. And when I share this, when I go to prisons, I go to detox um, centers, I got to go to a rehab um, center here in, in Connecticut uh, in a couple of hours, you know, so therefore when I share it from that perspective, you know, it, it takes away the stigma, it, it, it humanizes um, these experiences and understand that there's there's a reason why you're reaching for something outside of yourself. And once you, you you know, it's really all about having that courage to really go within and, and really look at that, you know? And it does take courage to to do that. It's, it's you know, who wants to feel um, those emotions that, that we suppressed for, for many years? 
when, right. we, when, we, when we connect with um you know either therapy or a healer or whatever the case may be to address those issues and how we can find freedom you know from that issues and we can heal and begin that healing process is, is a very profound experience and when i add the sound to it the sound component after i thought share my story and share it from the lens of, of a human experience and utilize the sound to help us to calm their minds to relax their body and to truly nourish their souls it, it brings people back home back into home excuse me, back into mm. homostasis, back into balance, you know, and, you know, with the sound therapy, you, you get a sense of mental clarity, rejuvenation. Um, you had the opportunity to connect to your inner healer, your inner GPS, your inner guru, so to speak, to help mm. you to navigate in a life that works best for you. But like I said How earlier, you got to feel those emotions and sometimes right. emotion can be very, very intense, but we got to feel And, that, and that's where having the right team, right? I always mm -hmm. say it's like, you want somebody that helps you if you need med you know, physical medicine, like an actual doctor, mm -hmm. you need possibly a therapist or ideally, and here's the other thing with therapy guys, uh, for those who are living, li I can talk today, listening, um, you know, not all therapists are trained in trauma recovery. So it's, it's hugely important. Or if you have some sort of subsets like addiction or domestic violence or sexual assault, it's hugely mm -hmm. important to make sure you seek out a therapist that has those specialties and training because mm -hmm. dealing with recovery, it's so important, right? Absolutely. Now, how does, um, how does that separate with somebody like with prison? Cause I think that's even a bigger stigma, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like I was incarcerated. I mean, I, I talk about in this book here, right? How, mm -hmm. how I was incarcerated without ever being charged without, without even being accused, charged or convicted of a crime while I was also denied my right to a lawyer. And wow. the reason they put down a one paper was one thing, but the real reason was because I was trying to get a judge removed who was granting custody to a documented abuser. Mm. But I only started feeling comfortable, as I said earlier, like to sharing that because there was a stigma. I mean, even mm -hmm. even with me saying that I was never charged, but say I was in prison, like people like go like this to you, right? Yeah. So yeah. like what when when you share with people that have like records, right? That have those those things what shows up for them like when you share your story like where, where like what's the what's some of those hot buttons that that happen for them to be able to know that they can shift their life too the, the power is there but also the power to shift our life is there for for returning citizens or, or formerly incarcerated individuals but yeah. so are the barriers so there are yeah. many barriers associated there's certain policy very bad policies for formerly incarcerated people that that's you know, it creates certain levels of of just hardship for many people. Like, you know, it's hard to find a job. Sometimes it's hard to get um, um, housing. Uh, how, it's hard to get certain benefits, um, you, know, with a, you know, with a felony conviction. So there's so many different, you know, policies in place that's really helping people to really be a part of that recidivism statistic, you know, in and out of, in and out of prison, in and out of prison. And I believe it's designed like that intentionally. You know, mm -hmm. so therefore, you know, we got to understand the pitfalls um, associated with uh, formerly incarcerated individuals. And it's real. And it's real, particularly around black and brown um, people. You know, the so-called war on drugs was a war on, on, on communities of color, you know. And, you know, the, the opiate epidemic, um, that's not, nothing new, particularly in the black and brown communities in the 60s and 70s. A lot of people, even people from the war were coming home back into the communities and it was filled with heroin, you know, and, and people were dying. And, you know, there's so much racism around addiction as well too, you know, mm -hmm. and certain drugs, classification of drugs, um, you get longer sentences, like crack cocaine, you know, you get longer sentences and crack cocaine is, was known to predominantly affect on the black and brown communities, whereas powder cocaine, which is the same form of cocaine, okay, just it's the same, it's cocaine, but it's in a different, powder form and, and crack is on a is more of a, a cooked hard form but it's, it's all cocaine you get a, a less sentence and you know powder cocaine is associated with um you know business people you know people mm -hmm. in the suburbs or, or white white community so therefore there's so much racism that plays on to um sentences for for drugs and that's how mass incarceration start and seeing so many black and brown folks being incarcerated, you know, because of the, these drug convictions and, and how these drug convictions make it very challenging and difficult for people to find jobs, to find housing, you know, find opportunities. And, 
it's very systemic in how this how this happened you know so how so how so how do you because i mean obviously you're also talking to them and i know there's like these real bears which you know i'm mm -hmm. actually working i'm hoping to work with a group i just discovered mm -hmm in Massachusetts that's uh, trying to address the incarceration rate with females wrongfully. And, mm -hmm. and um, so I might be working with them looking to look more information. So how do you, like, how does like somebody, especially, especially folks that are black and brown skin, especially mm -hmm. those that are male that have that, a, you know, that incarceration in their um, history, right? Mm -hmm. How do, how, how do you help them or how, how do they finally get inspired by somebody like you? Because you're a walking poster child to say you can do it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you are. You are Kelvin, right? Yeah, thank you. So um, how, like, what are some of the responses? Because especially, yes, I mean, this is a real thing. Like, people mm -hmm. don't realize the barriers mm -hmm. and the racism. And, you know, it's, it's, some, some even say it's a form of, another form of enslavement to control folks of my, of of color, right? Is yes. to structural oppression. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, so how how does those folks, especially from the incarceration route, find inspiration to want to change? You yeah. know, a very difficult a very difficult path with the run. Absolutely. Well, at, at the healthcare you know center I work at in Hartford, I work with returning um, citizens. You know, are from the incarcerated mm -hmm. people, and I connect them to our integrated healthcare services, such as primary care, mental health care, and addiction recovery services, but also provide that peer support to help to address some of the social determinants to health, such as housing, such as employment, you know, such as um, basic needs, um, you know, insurance, all these different things that people need to, um, to make that uh, transition successfully back in the community. And I always start off by sharing my experience, letting people know that, okay, I've been incarcerated, I, I've been there. And, you know, I listen to people's and, and listen to what they want to achieve, what goals um, they want to accomplish while they while they're home. So therefore, what I do is I link them up to different resources in the communities to help them to address their goals, help them to reach mm -hmm. their goals. And I provide that weekly peer support and coaching to help them to to motivate them, to keep them keep them going, you know, and to, you know, if they have any uh, reservations about something or they need to talk something through. You know, I'm there to be a sounding board. I'm be, I'm there to like help them to put things in proper perspective so they can move forward in their life without, you know, returning back to prison. And just having someone there that believes in them and have that lived experience, it just it is it's profound. Um, it helps reduce the recidivism, uh, recidivism uh, statistic. You know, and if a person can stay out of prison for, uh, you know, three to five years, you know, chances are are really less that they they re will reoffend. So therefore, mm -hmm. my, my job, my work is to really connect them to the different resources, uh, connect them to the community, help them to address their, their issues, if they have any issues. But the majority of people that's incarcerated, 85% um, of people incarcerated have a mental health and a substance use um, disorder or some type of uh, issue with, with um, addiction. And what I've learned personally and professionally is majority of people that's incarcerated are traumatized human beings. And they get yeah. re-traumatized within the criminal justice system. And 95% of people that's incarcerated, they have a release date. They're coming back to the communities. So therefore, you know, why don't we create these these structures within the prison system to help people to address uh, their mental health challenges, help them address their addiction issues um, before returning back into the community? Because, you know, one of the keys that, you know, I'll share in a few minutes is, is one of it is really doing the inner work. You know, like I had- a, right, So hold on, hold on one second. Because we're, like, we're going into that right now. <laughs> you're, already, you're already there. So what I want you to do is share three keys that folks can take with them, like that might be start with its addiction, whether it's re-entry from being incarcerated, mm -hmm. whether it's even like, what is it? What are three things somebody who might be listening that might need to hear right now that they can mm -hmm. take with them? The first thing I believe is you got to do the inner work. You know, you, you got to address the, the root causes of, of your experience, whether it's just trauma, whether it's emotional distress, whether it's toxic, chronic stress, whatever it is that's, that got, that land us in prison, you know, it's important to, to look at that, you know, from a holistic perspective, meaning mentally, emotionally, spiritually, as well as physically. And having a counselor or a therapist or a practitioner that can help you to, to do that, I think that's key because I, I, I believe it, it starts by, by shifting the way we see ourselves in the world and the people in it, you know, um, I think um, Albert Einstein said he can't, you know, he can't change a problem with the same level of consciousness that created it, 
you know, so therefore we have to shift the way we see ourselves. We have to shift the level of consciousness. And I believe that shift happens when we do uh, the inner work, when we start addressing uh, some of the root issues that we've been dealing with. And, and another um, thing I believe that people need to do is they got to create a plan. You know, they got to have some goals. They got to have some ideas what they want to do with their life. What's going to um, get them excited about life? What's going to get them, pa what people are passionate about? You know, what's going to get people out of bed? And we got to, like, write these things down, you know, and, and just really create a plan of action around that, you know, really figure out what you want to do with your life, what your le what le legacy is going to be while you're here. And the third mm. third um, thing is, is you, you got to have support. You can't do it alone. You know, we're, 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 we're social beings. We thrive in community. You know, we're wired to connect. And I believe that connection, the authentic human connection, is the cure for feelings of loneliness, isolation, depression, and different other types of emotional distresses that we experience in our life. So having support from professional support, from our, um, our psychiatrists, our medical doctor, therapists, um, recovery sports specialists, coaches, uh, what have you, um, you know, that, that's great. Um, even, or even natural supports from our family, our friends, our, our loved ones, the people who have our best interests at heart, or even community support from our, our churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, 12-step uh, communities, recovery mm -hmm. communities, uh, different uh, social communities that we have uh, within our, ourselves to help us to, to move forward with our plan of action and help us to implement that as well, too. But if you don't have a plan, you don't have no direction, you don't know where you're going. So it's important for us to know the direction we want to go. And sometimes you got to make a plan A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But we got to have a plan. You know, we got to have some goals. Yeah. We got to have a direction where you want to go um, in life. So those are the three things I, I feel that people need to do is, is, is address the root, root causes, do the inner work, you know, create a goal and a plan of action and get the support to do that, to implement it. That's so important, right? I mean, and, and you don't even know and what I hear people just even with trauma or plan of action. A lot of times they don't even know what to write, but you don't know what to write or what the plan would be. Maybe the plan to start is just to do the inner work right now, mm -hmm. because by doing the inner work and addressing the root issues, you're going to know that because you're going to have no space around it. And you're going to be able to see clearly mm -hmm. to then actually put down, OK, now because now you're sober, right? Now you've got all these things that you can create a plan, you can create the goals, the goals, and 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 yeah, I mean that's, that's so so important, you know. Mm -hmm. And don't be afraid, you know, to try something that's you know as one of the twelve step things, right? Be open minded, right? Yeah, yeah. Be open minded to try new things that before maybe be like, ew, maybe I wouldn't, right? Because we do that all the time, right? We're like, yeah. oh, I don't know, <laughs> like you know, it's like sounds like cooties, right? Yeah. Right, but. <laughs> It's and, like, having, and having that fear is okay, you know what I mean? Right? But, like, but when we go within and find that courage to move beyond that fear, yeah. it's so powerful. Because one of the things I learned about the human being is that we are resilient. We are resilient human beings. You know, we know how to um, bounce back from, you know, adversity, setbacks, different challenges in our life. So we have the power within us to be courageous, to move past that fear and to yeah. achieve whatever we want to achieve in our life. Yeah, I, I would say the courage has to be stronger than the fear. Mm, you know, yeah. the courage has to be stronger than the fear because yeah. I, I watched this and with this, I saw this video once um, and it was portraying somebody struggling with leaving and dealing with healing from domestic violence. And it was a beautiful kind of video. I wish I could find it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was at a conference when I saw it and it was basically this woman kind of like looked like the Garden of Eden. Right. Mm -hmm. And it kind of gave that kind of feel. Right. Eve in the Garden of Eden. And she's running through the forest and the whatever and she sees this dark faceless figure that almost looks like the grim reaper mm. right and she goes ooh, and she runs away and she tries to run away from it like oh I'm, I'm, here's my threat right here's my yeah. threat i'm running away I'm running away and every time she sees it she runs away to the opposite direction turns around oh there it is and oh my gosh and next thing you know she turns around and it's standing right in front of her mm. and she looks up at the face and it's a mirror of the self mm. <laughs> and that's when she was able to recognize and then she was able to go through the cave and to go to the other side. Mm. Right. So we, we have to remember that, you know, whatever happened to us is one thing, but our courage has to be stronger than our fears. And when we, mm -hmm. when we explore and release love, whatever it is, it's in those shadow parts that needs to come out, you know, it's mm -hmm. not reliving. It is just helping you to release. So, you know, I always say when we can make peace with our shadows, 
we then become the superhero. And I, and I think it kind of clicked with me with like Wonder Woman, right? I was like, Wonder Woman, she didn't really have her power until she was able to face her darkest part of herself. And I think every superhero uh, hero movie kind of has that same thing. Like they don't really become fully like a superhero until they really face something really dark, yeah. right? And that dark part of themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, so it is so, so important. And Kelvin, where can somebody find you if they want to be looking for you uh, more <laughs> and have you speak or whatever? <laughs> people are more than welcome to go to my website at kelvinbyoung.com. Uh, uh, you can reach me. There's my contact information, my direct uh, telephone number. You can email me as well, too. And you're more than, to, you know, you're more than able to reach for me um, at that um, platform on that website. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And we will have additional links and resources mm -hmm. listed in the uh, description. So thank you for joining us. Have a great day. Until next time. Bye-bye.